Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning to you all here in beautiful Rangos Auditorium, and good morning to all of you out there virtually joining us. Very glad to have everyone here today for Grand Rounds, uh, which will be kicking off our third annual DEI Symposium, the intersection of religion, spirituality, and medicine. Um, but before we get started with our Grand Round speaker, and I will be introducing him, we have two things that we would like to do. <clears throat> the first one for me is to give thanks. I, you know, this does not come together without many people working as a team. And so I want to give a shout out and huge thanks to multiple people on the DEI Symposium Committee. And that would include Jess Hamill, Savannah Ryder, AJ Hartman, Noel Spears, Katie Williams, and Sarah Warwick. I wanna thank each and every one of them for all their help in bringing all of you together today. So many thanks for that. And our second item today is a very special presentation of an award, our first JEDI Award. And for that, I would like to bring to the podium Dr. Sylvia Choi, our Vice Chair for Faculty Affairs. Hi, good morning, everyone. The Department of Pediatrics is committed to leadership in pediatric healthcare, education, and discovery. Diversity, equity, and inclusion are essential to our mission of creating an environment in which all of our faculty, staff, and trainees are valued and empowered to thrive and in which all of our patients and families are supported to meet their healthcare goals. The JEDI Award is to recognize a member of the Department of Pediatrics faculty who is a champion of justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion in pediatric medicine and our community. I am thrilled to announce the first recipient of our JEDI Award is Dr. Sylvia Owusu-Ansa. Would you please come up to the stage? I will share her nomination, which summarizes why she is most deserving of this recognition. I nominate Dr. Sylvia Uusoansa for the 2023 JEDI Award for the depth, breadth, and commitment of her work in this space. Sylvia combines vision on multiple levels of what should and can be with the intense grit and dedication to make things happen, to be the change you wish to see in the world. At the department and school of medicine level, Sylvia has tirelessly spoken out to leadership at both Children's and UPMC about the need to create and support a diverse group of providers. She identified a key challenge for those from underrepresented communities, that of the wealth gap. Sylvia brought to the attention of leadership that the wealth gap between URIM and white Americans is 10 to one. Her indefatigable efforts culminated in a loan forgiveness program for our URIM faculty. Sylvia's vision shown when she conceived and brought together URIM faculty to learn how to join the club where deals and relationships are made on the golf course. She organized an evening for URIM faculty to learn the basics of golf while also hearing about financial management at health, wealth, and recreation event. At the community level, Sylvia has collaborated with her colleagues, Dr. Spears and Torres, bringing knowledge and inspiration to Pittsburgh's most impoverished and diverse children at Arsenal Middle School here in Lawrenceville via CHAMP, the Career Help Advancement and Achievement Program. CHAMP, a multi-dimensional program, brilliantly uses the cascading model of mentorship with URIM medical students mentored by the faculty around curriculum building for the middle school students. And at the national level, Sylvia is working with our elected state leaders Representative Summer Lee and Senator John Fetterman to get congressional recognition for Freedom House, the nation's first emergency medical service staffed by trained paramedics, staffed entirely by black paramedics. For all this and more, Dr. Owusu Ansa truly deserves this year's JEDI Award. Join me in congratulating her.
could not be more thrilled about that presentation. And so now it is my wonderful pleasure to introduce Dr. Asim Padella. Dr. Padella is an internationally recognized thought and research leader, as well as a widely sought after lecturer. And I can attest to that, having been one of those people who sought him out. Uh, he works in the field um, in Muslim community health research and intervention design and Islamic bioethics. Using Muslim Americans and Islam as a model, he studies how religion impacts patient health behaviors and healthcare experiences, informs the professional identities and workplace experiences of clinicians, and furnishes bioethical guidance to patients, providers, policymakers, and religious leaders. This knowledge, and of course, this is really quite key when we have someone in a leader in a field, is that after all this, this knowledge is subsequently mobilized towards educational and policy interventions. This is how we make change. Methodologically, Dr. Padella's exper expertise spans community-engaged research, religiously tailored and faith-based message design, educational interventions aimed at health behavior change, discourse analysis, and mixed methods research. His current projects span behaviors related to cancer screening, organ donation, and end-of-life care, as well as the intersection of religion and science, and are funded by the John Templeton Foundation, the Health Research and Services Administration, the Greenwald Foundation, and the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute. Not surprisingly, he has authored over 120 peer-reviewed journal articles and book chapters, three books, and serves as an editorial in an editorial capacity for the Encyclopedia of Islamic Bioethics, the American Journal of Bioethics, Medical Ethics, International Journal of Islam, Journal of Medical Humanities, and the Journal of Islam and Contemporary World. And again, the, the incredible strength of Dr. Padella is that he goes beyond um, our academic little cocoon here and shares his work and knowledge um, with the greater world. And that is because he is a expert commentary person on um, in the New York Times, featured in US Today, Chicago Tribune, Washington Post, National Public Radio, the Chicago Sun-Times, and CNN. It is my great honor and pleasure to introduce Dr. Asim Padella. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. It's, it's really an honor to be with you uh, today. I'm sorry I can't be there in person. I know that after COVID, uh, we've been able to have some fellowship together. And, and unfortunately, today I couldn't make it in. But hopefully, you'll hear my enthusiasm through my virtual presentation. But it's really an honor. Thank you, Dr. Mateo, Dr. Spears, and everybody else who have put this on. I know you're going to have a wonderful day today. And I, I'm privileged to be able to kick it off. Um, so with that, I'm going to share my screen and again, the talk. And really, I would like to have some interaction. There'll be points within my talk while I'll open the, the forum for conversation. And certainly after my talk, there will be as well. So give me one moment. And hopefully we can go in. So today I'm going to speak a little bit about Muslim experiences, as you heard in the introduction, that I use Muslim experiences as a lens to think about religion and medicine, but also in this case, diversity and inclusion. So I'm going to speak about Muslim experiences and think about the, the quote unquote problem of religion and medicine through that lens. But before I get there, I wanna give you a little bit of the context, right? That I think we all know, but let me foreground it for everybody. That when we think about religion and medicine and that, and that intersection, oftentimes we think about this conflict notion, right? Particularly in, in the, in the uh, uh, policy arena, and in the courts where there are questions around how religion should manifest itself as a barrier to what patients would like, or as a way in which uh, physicians claim conscience for things they would not like to do. Right? And recently, obviously in the United States, we had a larger conflict around reproductive rights uh, in court cases in the Supreme Court, thinking about whether or not there should be some religious notion that might limit people's access to certain types of treatments. This plays a significant role in American medicine, but it does also globally. And uh, I need not to tell you that in the pandemic, religious sort of uh, communities were often thought about as places where they are not following guidance and that therefore the pandemic is increasing, right? That the public health guidance was not being filed by certain religious communities. So this conflict thesis, at least in the public, uh, the public memory is very recent. But there's a long history to this. And I would say that the conflict in religion and science is a post-enlightenment heritage of European and uh, of European thought. 
that has made its way into medicine, right? So religion is on one side and science, in this case, medicine should be the other, where religion, uh, where science is the domain of empiricism, rationality, and it's universal, but religion is the realm of superstition, belief, and it's particular. And the twain together shouldn't meet. You see, there's a line here. Sometimes people cl get close to the line, but really they should stay separate. The, the reality is, is that we in medicine, and I'll say this, uh, I'll make this claim, and I can back it up perhaps if you like in the Q&A, that for us, we have become very uh, naturalistic in our practice, right? That we think about materialism. And so when we, when we engage with the, just an essential question of what the human being is, the patient is a human being, so is a provider, that we only think about the material and formal causes. We don't at all discuss the efficient and final causes, meaning that we are reductionistic, reductionistic in the way that we think about the entity which we care for. And that plays a role in how we think about health, right? So oftentimes when we teach and when we uh, provide therapeutics, we think about the biological dimension of the human being. Sometimes we think about the psychological dimension. These are foregrounded. Now, more often we think about the social dimension and I would say that the spiritual dimension of the human being is marginalized. It is present sometimes, but oftentimes there's not in our daily encounters between the patient and the provider. And when we teach medicine in medical school, uh, I think that there are, we, we rarely talk about what the human being is from a spiritual lens. So that's my claim, and we can talk a little about it later. But that's the background to which I'm going to talk a little bit about Muslim Americans. And the claim I'll make is that they're seen but they're invisible and that they are margin at the margins of diversity, equity, inclusion, and healthcare. And here's a quote from a participant in a focus group many years ago that I did from a Muslim woman. She said, it's the patient is the one who has to say, pay attention. I'm a Muslim woman and I have this modesty issue. The healthcare staff should already be sensitized to this, but oftentimes they are not, right? So we're seen, she a, was a hijabi woman, but she feels that she's invisible in the encounter, meaning her values, in this case, modesty, was invisible and not taken into account. I will make the claim that uh, to resolve this, we should think about medicine and religion both as cultural systems, that they are a convergence between the ways they think about things, but there is also significant divergence. Religions and medicine both inform understandings of health, illness, healing, and cure. Therefore, they impact health and healthcare seeking behaviors and obviously healthcare decisions. At the core, both medicine and religion address fundamental queries about the human being. They provide explanations about phenomena, and I do a lot of work in end of life care. They answer the question of what is the human being's end? But they involve differing epistemic and ontological frameworks. The way we know what we know is different in medicine and uh, religion. And how we think about the dimensionality of reality is different. So there are significant differences, right? So for an example, one might think that perhaps God is punishing them and they, that's why they became ill. Or someone might say there is a little bug somewhere. Maybe you can't see it. And that's causing your malady, right? So they explain these phenomena, but they evolve different epistemic and ontological frameworks to do so. But if we are to treat both of them as cultural frameworks, right? Then we, with their own ontological, epistemic, and moral schema, that would provide insight into how human beings act. Specifically, why some patients and families hope for miracles and ignore medical advice, or why some patients and families vigorously oppose withholding and withdrawing life support, and why ethics consults can be very hard. But we were, if we were to do so, they would also promote the idea that there's greater understanding and tolerance of patient, provider, and family words and actions. We can get a better understanding of the problem space and the solution space, and would enhance our communication models and negotiation of paths that meet both needs, right? The needs of the patient and the providers, but in this case, are also negotiated between what would be permissible from a religious lens and what medicine has to offer. And I would say that this would allow, I hope, and this is where I've spent a lot of my life, increased philosophical, theological, and social scientific, as well as empirical research on fundamental questions about medicine and the human being. So that's my claim right, of what the background is, where Muslims reside, and how I think we could potentially move forward if we take both of these domains of knowledge right, as deep frameworks. So let's now move a little bit into the Muslim sphere uh, and DEI. I will say you heard a little bit about this in the introduction, in the kind of introduction that I do a lot of my work at this intersection between the Islamic tradition, biomedicine, and Muslim practices. 
And there were two events, I would say, in my early career that informed what is my scholarship today. One of them was at the patient lens when a provider, as a provider, a really resident, a family member of a patient asked me, amongst the various other residents, to take care of his mother. And I wrote that, that case up, but they were clearly choosing my background as a provider to be the individual who would engage in that healthcare encounter. And then on the other side, when I was a resident, when I was pushed out of that encounter, right? when a patient said to me and then my attending, I don't want a terrorist as my doctor, don't have him come back in, right? So one, I was allowed in, and the other one, and I was chosen, quote unquote, and the other, I was pushed out of that encounter. And that led me to a research enterprise that involves thinking about patient and community-centered healthcare, right? We wanna identify values and address them that contribute to health inequities. As a provider for that family, right? Perhaps it is something that others would not have done because we had a shared background. On the other side, when you tell some people you don't want those physicians taking care of you or those providers, you might lead to inequities. And I also focus on the provider and the system way in which we respond to these sorts of re requests, right? Where there's tension between professional and personal identities for providers right? and how do we resolve that ethically in policy. And then lastly, what is the whole idea of behind all this, right? How do we bioethically analyze healthcare accommodations for patients and providers? So I made the claim Muslims are seen and invisible, right? At the same time. And I'll say that we have, you know, barring our, our former Secretary of Defense, Donald Roosevelt's idea about ignorance, that we reside in the uh, unknown unknowns. That if we're asked a simple question, in the United States, right, using all our healthcare databases, right, what are the aggregate Muslim healthcare outcomes and what's their aggregate status? That this is a known unknown. That's been set up because of structural problems in the way we think about healthcare data acquisition. You know, Muslim Americans uh, are not found in these databases because religious affiliation is not captured in national data sets. And our national surveys, like the NHIS, don't capture religious affiliation either, right? Religious identity, rather, is often overlooked in health equity research and assessment. Even our National Healthcare Quality and uh, Disparities Report put out by ARC does not think about the religious dimension of the human being. Why? Well, this was set up many, many, many years ago, right? So in 1976, Congress amended the census law, right, to prohibit mandatory questions regarding religious beliefs or membership to a religious body. This is after a wide debate amongst very uh, let's say, established corners within society, right? So what do the religious communities have to say about this? Well, from the American Jewish perspective, right, questions such as these about what religion you are were seen as a violation and a, and a violation of the separation of church and state, right? While Catholics, uh, they felt that we should, right? And I'm generalizing here, but the voices that were at the, the congressional sessions, they said, no, we should do so because we want to be able to understand whether our denominations are growing or declining, while Protestant groups felt that religious membership is more of a social identity, right? So we don't necessarily need to have that within our census. So in the end, the census prohibited data collection along religious affiliation, and that led to almost every administrative database in the United States, right? And every national survey not collecting religious affiliation. That's how it all became, right? A convention. So what does that mean for us today? Like let's move from 1976 to 2023. So I, I conducted a national survey of Muslim Americans right, right, right before in the beginning of the pandemic. And I just asked a simple question in that survey, right? Were you asked about your religious affiliation by clerical staff when you were admitted to the hospital? So about 1,300 or so Muslim Americans across the nation and you know, almost three fourths of them said, no, we were never asked about our religious affiliation when we were admitted to the hospital. So we, we might collect some of this data some people might ask, but certainly the majority experiences that they're not asked about the religious identification. What does that mean? Well, that means when we think about, you know, healthcare disparities or healthcare inequities that are institutions that fund research or that aggregate data oftentimes uh, have a certain aspects of identity foreground and others they receive in the background. So for NIH specifically, right, as a researcher and as, uh, as an individual who tries to seek funding for that research, Trying to fit Muslim Americans into the dynamic of populations that have health disparities, you can't really do so because they define populations that have experienced health disparities as those who are religious and not religious, sorry, racial and ethnic minorities, those with lower income status, 
underserved rural communities, and sexual and gender minority groups. Uh, religious affiliation by in and of itself is not a factor in healthcare disparities. A group cannot be aggregated by religion and be considered into those uh, research portfolios, right? Or those funding lines. That's NIH, right? The biggest funder of our research in the United States. As I mentioned, so what are, it's important for us to think about what feature of identity, right, is foregrounded, race, economic status, right, where you live, and then your sexual and gender, gender identity. Everything else goes to the background. This plays a role today. So this is from my own hospital. We have a health equity initiative and dashboard. And as you can see here, when you think about patient care, what are the dimensions again that we foreground and how do we aggregate and collect data and how do we actually set thresholds for us to meet by race and ethnicity? That's what we say. If we have two populations of different racial dynamic and they have the same sort of screening rates, then we've done well. But that's the only dimension of identity that we capture. And I don't know what UPMC does, but I would argue, I think that most hospitals do it in this way, that the primary way they think about how are we serving our communities well is through a racial lens. And that has meaning, but my point is that's not all of it. So what is the known known about Muslim Americans in the United States, right? Before I give you some other data. Well, they number between five and 7 million. We can't collect them the, this data in the census. So there's always a question about what the estimate really is. But they're diverse racially and ethnically, right? So about a quarter are indigenous African Americans, a quarter South Asians, a quarter Arab, right? And the rest are, are Caucasian or other minority groups, right? Or, or they're different groups. So that's the idea. That's a very, it's a tapestry of different races and ethnicities, which is also why you can't collect just say one group here, and that's the one that's suffering from disparities. Diverse immigration history, two thirds are foreign born and a third are, are native born are here. Uh, for social economic status, and this is somewhat of a myth, uh, perpetrated that most Muslim Americans actually have no problem with language competency, right? 87% are English but literate and their household incomes sort of are on the same par as the general population. The, those with household incomes over 100,000, 14% while the general population is 16%. So it's not a, a, a impoverished group that is largely refugee and can't speak the, the language. That's not the case. And obviously I've aggregated this population based on their faith and they have high levels of religiosity as you can see here. The unknown known, right? So we talked about known unknowns. We talked about known knowns and sort of the unknown known here is that religious beliefs, values, and identity strongly influence health behaviors and practices of Muslim Americans across those other dimensions of identity that are often collected, race, ethnicity, social economics, and geographic lines. That religion is a factor similarly across those lines. Right? And that patient level health and healthcare inequities result from inadequate attention to not those dimensions, but the religious dimensions of health. And my work over, over decades has been on this, right? So we can see this in, in work around delayed healthcare seeking across race, ethnicity, geographic, and social economic lines because of lack of concordance. And that concordance is rooted in a religious value. Our poor adherence to cancer screening because of lack of religious tailoring of the way in which we deliver screening guidelines and pamphlets and brochures and education. Um, that there are worse mental health outcomes across these dimensions simply because of the fact that being a Muslim is an exposure to discrimination and bias in the America today. Right? And that ethical tensions and end of life care often result across, again, many of these uh, groups because of lack of accommodation of religious values that are important to Muslim Americans at the end of life. So this is what's the unknown known. That is a factor inadequately paid attention to, inadequately accommodated. This is a, a, a model of a, uh, you know, a theoretical framework for doing the research that I do, where we think about Islam as a factor, beliefs and values and, and ethical uh, guidelines that then come into the uh, clinical arena, right? And you can have cultural conflict there or ethical challenges and the way in which they're negotiated or non-negotiated impacts health and healthcare seeking, which can lead to healthcare disparities, right? Or outside of the healthcare system that, you know, religious views might inform how you think about disease and health, whether infertility is a disease or not. And then that influences your health behaviors and potentially your healthcare seeking behaviors and can lead to disparities amongst populations in the way they assign value to certain maladies as disease or not or experiences of discrimination outside the healthcare system again, right, can then lead to healthy or lack of healthy behaviors, 
which again inform healthcare seeking. So there are many ways in which healthcare disparities can be uh, can can be uh, uh, are a factor. Sorry, that religion is a factor in healthcare disparities, and both within the healthcare system and outside of it. So the lack of attention to this dimension of identity, I think, is very problematic for us who wants to champion diversity, equity, inclusion for the purposes of reducing health and healthcare inequities. So let me share some data. Again, this is from my own lab and work. Uh, there are other studies out there, but this is most familiar to me and I can speak best to in this sort of uh, conversation. So I mentioned delayed healthcare seeking, right? So a survey in Chicago land across mosques and community centers of 254 Muslim women found that 53% of them delayed seeking care because they could not find a, a female PCP in their panel or a female uh, you know, consultant that they wanted to go see for a, uh, an issue that required specialist care. Decreased cancer screening, again, 240 Muslim women in Chicago and we surveyed uh, from community centers and mosques, so both very religious and maybe not so religious individuals. Uh, over a third of them had not had a mammogram in the last uh, two years. Uh, and those who experienced religious discrimination at any time within the healthcare system were 1.25 times less likely to have adherence to cancer screening guidelines. And then in qualitative work around this end of life care phenomenon, there was a significant decrease. There was disquiet in the way in healthcare delivery is at the end of life. There was religious discomfort. And oftentimes they would say that, you know, our loved ones are gonna die in the hospital, but they don't have anything for us here. I mean, there's nothing to attend to our needs at the end of life. So what if you were, they were seen, right, but not invisible, that we would actually see religious identity and we would take it as a factor in health and healthcare seeking behavior and in comfort with care? What would that look like? Well, we that national survey I mentioned to you a few minutes ago, we asked these Muslim uh, community members about their needs in the hospital setting and whether they had received, when they were admitted to the hospital, such accommodations. So these were things such as neutral prayer space, halal food, <laughs> halal food, or their prayer services on Fridays in the hospital that they could attend, prayer rugs, the Quran, having a cha Muslim chaplain, particularly in end-of-life care, and whether they had medication without cork or alcohol. All of these things comes from early work around what are the accommodations they would like. So we asked them, did you are these important to you? And you can see here, right, most individuals in this large sample, all of these things were highly important, right? Somewhat or uh, are very important to them. But were they available in the hospitals? largely no. Right. So again, right, we can might see a religious identity, but there's no package of services that would be available to them should they disclose that religious identity. So this is a significant problem, right? The mismatch in our healthcare system for this group, and I think for other groups as well. So some of the work we do obviously is to make this sort of stuff, right? This invisible identity aspect visible. So we asked people, and those who saw that in a national survey, but, but we asked people in focus groups across <clears throat> racial, ethnic, and social economic lines, what changes would you like to see in the hospital to make you feel more comfortable as a Muslim patient? And in these 13 focus groups of over 100 people, there were three <clears throat> main things, right? I mentioned several in that survey, but here are three main things. That gender concordant care was very important. Right? It was important both in healthcare seeking and for the notion of modesty and privacy and encounter, halal food, and then a neutral prayer for, space for prayer, right? They felt very uncomfortable in the hospital when they were going to mm, largely areas that were for prayer, for, and they had iconography from Christian or other traditions. So why? Well, we know from data, survey and qualitative data, that this sort of these sort of accommodations influences healthcare seeking patterns, right? So as you see here, when someone's sick, right, and they don't find accommodations, they're hesitant to be in the same spot where they felt violated. Or the idea of gender concordance here, right? So related to modesty about being exposed for the opposite sex, and and uh, and the fact that they didn't have some privacy as well. So that that plays a role again in health and healthcare seeking behaviors after that encounter. Uh, a lack of halal food. I want to mention this one specifically. It was kind of related to health equity. This is the way they talked about it, right? That that everybody else gets meat, right? Except us. We always get vegetarian. That you can have. Yeah, you know, kosher food here, you can have various accommodations, but why is it that most Americans, particularly even in cities uh, that have a lot of populations of, of, of most Americans, that they don't get halal food? Um, and that a lack of prayer space, this neutral prayer space they want, right, um, was because they were uncomfortable praying, right, where there was religious iconography from other traditions. 
So you and I, all of us, really know that religion is a determinant of health. Right? Uh, we know this that it occur that it is a factor at various levels of the healthcare enterprise, right, in the individual realm as well as the structural realm. So you'll see on this this diagram, this is a model about healthcare research. Religion's all over the place, right? From a ideology worldview uh, perspective at the structural realm, right? And it's actually part of the identity of certain religious uh, institutions that deliver healthcare. It's at the interpersonal realm, right? It's also at the health status and the individual realm. We know that almost 40% of healthcare in the United States is delivered by religious institutions, uh, various sort of ways in which that manifests in the daily encounter, but we know that. Uh, and we also know from decades of research that religion or religious affiliation in and of itself is an independent factor for longevity. I don't need to make that argument, but that, that is true across various populations in the United States. So it's a determinant of health and a significant one. Yet again, I say by and large, we ignore this aspect of identity, particularly for minority populations in the United States. So I'm gonna pause here for a moment and stop sharing. And I'm happy to field a couple of questions before I move to the other part of the encounter. So we spoke a lot about the patient, and then I'm going to move to speak about the physician in the encounter. So I'm happy to take some questions. Pause my sharing for, to do that for a moment. If there are any. Is this on? Yeah, it's on. Hi, thank you so much for uh, giving you this really interesting talk. Um, I'm just wondering about the issue of uh, intersectionality in terms of just um, differences in Muslim people in terms of all of the other groups you mentioned, but then also within Islam in terms of different cultures, having different religiosity, or even within an individual having um, different kind of seriousness about keeping halal and things like that. Um, just wondering what your thoughts are about that. Certainly, I think, I think you know, the, uh... We have to recognize ind every individual is a unique in the, uh, person, right? And they have their own values. And at times over, they might have certain values and that might change, right, in the future, or that might've been different in the past, certainly. And as you also mentioned that everybody's identity is a composite, right, of different dimensions. What I've tried to present here is that the religious identity dimension, right, has uh, is a factor in their health and healthcare seeking behaviors and in disparities across some other measures of of their identity, right? So these are independent. Obviously, when we do analysis and surveys, we can say, okay, is, you know, is in our multivariate model, is it race, ethnicity and together, right? Or is it just, I mean, race, ethnicity and religious identity together, or is it, can it be a separate independent factor? And what I'm trying to set up is that across African-American, South Asian, right? Arab, uh, even Caucasian Muslims, across, right, those who have higher income, lower income, that religious values manifest themselves in the way that they experience healthcare. And it is not beneficial for us as providers to ignore that. So I'm setting up this idea that we they're seen, but the way in which we sort of let that religious value not be attended to is problematic. But for every individual encounter, the way in which, as you said, right, the way in which they affiliate or not affiliate or with their religious tradition is going to be different. So, but we have to ask, right? We can't just let it be that we're not going to touch it. Oftentimes we don't touch it. And as you'll see, as the claim I made here is that, that even if things are a neutral prayer space, that's just not for just Muslims, right? Many other groups would find that to be of value, but they don't find that in the hospital for themselves. That's the structural problem. So that's that's what I'm setting up. The fact is that we in America, we know that there's a lot of value to religion in how health is delivered, right? We deal with this issue of conscious causes all the time ethically. And we know that for patients, we have offices of spiritual support and care. But even those offices of spiritual support and care, how many of them have Muslim chaplains in that dynamic? Very few. Right? So I, I'm making the case that for this population, we just neglect a lot of their religious identity. Yet yeah, in the social sphere, most of Americans in post 9 America, that's the first aspect of identity that people identify with, right? 
and they are subject to a lot of social, and you'll see now, I'll show this and I'm going to talk about the providers, that a lot of social discrimination or everyday discrimination spills over in the healthcare encounter for people both on the patient level and the physician level. And again, our inattention to their fact that they have a religious identity leads to problems for them being in medicine. So thank so you, Dr. Make, Perdella. Yeah, does that make sense? We have a comment um, from Natalie that speaks to what you just said that um, it says, we are working with Muslim doctors now to address Muslim patients and to get a Muslim chaplain. But when healthcare systems do not see chaplains as important, it makes it difficult to address patient religious concerns. And then we have a question, which I think is um, a setup for your part two, but I fully appreciate the challenges of male care caregivers for female Muslim patients, but how do you suggest we manage that with sensitivity with the staffing we have? There often is not an alternative attending a resident available. Yeah, so that's great. So we, down at the practical level, I'm, a, I'm an emergency medicine physician, right? So we are even potentially even more resource poor at times particularly when we're single coverage, you know, in the UD at night at times. So, so certainly I, I think uh, I recognize that practical constraint uh, and actually patients too as well. So in our focus groups, uh, we found that it wasn't so much that, yes, there's a value system. They want to be able to express that value system. They want you to at least consider the accommodation, but the fact that no one's asked or no one considers, like the first quote I share with you, right? Why do I, as a patient, always have to say, I'm wearing a hijab, right? I'm a Muslim woman. Right, you don't see me as a Muslim woman, and I might have a modesty issue. Why can't it be not my, my onus, but the healthcare system? Say, okay, well, is there something I could do to accommodate you? And if I don't, well, what can we do and make this kind of somewhat not as traumatic as it could be? So the healthcare system, we are always taught as medical students, or at least I was, I right, don't assume, don't assume, don't assume. And what patients are saying is, well, why? What everywhere else you assume I'm a Muslim American and I'm subject to all the negativity of being a Muslim American in America. When I come into the healthcare uh, encounter, when I want to be safe, that no one at least thinks about the fact that maybe there's something here that you ask me, how can I accommodate? How can I help you feel more comfortable in the environment? That's the problem. The conversation never occurs that way. And then we're subject to whatever they have at the time. So I think it's more about messaging and framing. And certainly, you know, I've been in, in, in occasions where we have been able to have an you know, APP take care of a patient because that's what their, their, their needs were. And I'll tell you that in certain aspects of healthcare, we are very, for gender and sexual, uh, same sex accommodation, we're very um, willing to do so. So in l &D or for our rape victims, we are very, we have established ways and protocols by which we are able to accommodate that for those segments of the population. I'm not saying that we should do that for everybody, but I'm saying that we can if we put our mind to it. Oftentimes we don't, and that's what they experience. Right? They just experience that this is not possible. I'll share with you the other data point from that survey, and then I'll move on and take questions at the end. That I said, fifty-three percent of Muslim women had experienced delayed healthcare seeking, right, or had reported delayed healthcare seeking. We did the similar survey on men. Over twenty percent of men, Muslim men. It's not just a female issue. They say, Muslim issue potentially, right? It's a religious value. And that's what I was saying about the intersectionality, right? That it occurs across even sexual uh, or gender in this case, identity. So let me move to the physician side and then we'll take some questions at the end. So, uh, you know, in DEI work, we always have this aspirational vision that we'll have a very diverse workforce and they'll get along and we'll all be smiling and things will be great and that they'll be great for both the providers and it'll be good for the patients and actually ultimately good for society. Right? That's why a lot of us are involved in this work, that we have this aspirational ideal that we want to reach to. And we want to do that because we think there are ethical underpinnings to having a healthcare diverse or workforce that's diverse in healthcare, right? Social justice issues or human rights. And there are certainly practical motivations as well. We know from uh, you know decades of work that there is empirical evidence for benefit on the patient side and the provider side. So if you have increased diversity in the health professions, we uh, have studies that show there's improved access to care for minor, minority and minoritized groups, right? There's often an increased quality of care by strengthening the patient-doctor relationship or uh, reducing communication and cultural barriers. And ultimately, that leads to healthcare outcomes that are improved for populations. So there is clearly data to substantiate this. There's also a business case, which I won't get into, for having a diverse healthcare workforce. So I think that's why the symposium, right? That we know this is a benefit. It's an instrumental benefit to healthcare outcomes, but it's also an intrinsic benefit for society. 
And then we set up in our healthcare systems these equity, diversity, inclusion dashboards, right? About how our what our staff looks like. So this is again from my own hospital here, where we look at the and note this, right? The the racial composition of our workforce and set up targets to become more diverse on the dimension of race and ethnicity of our workforce. But what do we also know occurs in the healthcare system when you have a diverse workforce? Well, there are many studies that show that there's discrimination amongst uh, uh, the workforce that is diverse, right? And oftentimes we ignore that, uh, or at least ignore that in policy interventions. So this is a now dated study from Massachusetts, which um, oversampled IMGs and, and minority groups, and they found 63% of, of this uh, Massachusetts workforce reported discrimination in the workplace. And those who did more often, were those who were international medical graduates, uh, racial minorities and women, right? Uh, a similar national survey, not just in Massachusetts, uh, sampled through the AMA master file and the National Medical uh, Society repeats this, echoes these data, where the discrimination over the career was very significant for African-Americans and almost half of Asians, a little bit less for Hispanic, Latino populations and, and white individuals, but it's present. And currently at that time, this study, I think it was from 2012 or 2013, right, you see, again, there was current levels of discrimination. It's not just historical. And when you do just, just the academic sample, we always think, hey, perhaps the academic environment is better. Well, maybe not, right? So there's also, for those faculty at US medical schools in the academic environment, there are also high levels of racial ethnic discrimination that they experience in their career. So it's not all a rosy picture when we want to put together a diverse workforce. And these were all uh, uh, surveys that were done on physician groups and I'm sure that for other uh, providers, the same is the case. And now moving to the Muslim lens, and here's another quote from a, a interview that we did in, in our shop, where a, a South Asian Muslim physician said, you know, being Muslim or visibly Muslim or a practicing Muslim is going to impact us, meaning the Muslim uh, physician group, in some negative way. That there's no going around that. That if we express our identity in this way or show it, that's going to be negative in the healthcare environment. So what do we know about American Muslim physicians in the United States? Well, they comprise over 5% of the workforce. This again is dated from 2012 so and larger numbers now. And that a significant source of international medical graduates come from Muslim uh, backgrounds, right? So you see here in the countries that are listed in the top 10 uh, of source of IMGs in the United States workforce, that five of them have significant Muslim populations. And in terms of the social characteristics of Muslim American physicians, we know they're very active in the Muslim community and that they're highly religious. They're more religious at times than the patient population. And it's a very highly valued profession and culturally in the Muslim community. So uh, over the past decade or so, uh, we've done national surveys of Muslim physicians in, in the United States. And so this is kind of the setup of those surveys where we looked at English speaking, practicing self-identified Muslim physicians. And, and we did a survey in 2013. I'll share some data points for, with you on that. And then 2021, we did a national survey and then some interviews as well, right? So the different sampling frames slightly, but there was no clear way to get out a national sample. So we used uh, national Muslim organiza physician organizations through which we sampled uh, physicians. And there are several papers that recently came out on this. So let me share with you some data points for us to think about DEI from their lens. So Muslim physicians, I'll make the claim, right, that are increasingly experiencing religious discrimination in the healthcare workplace. So in 2013 of our sample, so you should know that we had, and it's here, 264 and 255, so about 250 physicians in both surveys. But in 2013, about a quarter, right, sometimes, often, or always, we're, we're experiencing religious discrimination. We asked that, right, compared to, and we also asked about um, racial and you know gender identity discrimination. So in terms of religious discrimination, and we can talk about how that might be difficult to tease out, but we asked them that specifically, a quarter in 2021, over a half, said that they were experienced, they had experienced religious discrimination over the, the career. And where does that play a role? How does it manifest? Well, it's at different levels of interaction. So from patients, from colleagues, from leadership, and they experience uh, when there are no accommodations for the identity from the institution, they also voice that the institution itself, right, is discriminating against my identity. We know that those who are more religious, right, the higher levels of adjustity, practiced and value-based, 
So those who say there's greater importance to this identity, that's associated with more negative outcomes, increased discrimination, increased perceptions of job scrutiny, increased struggle to pray at work, more li a greater likelihood of leaving a job, and more experiences of patients refusing their care because they're a religious provider of Muslim background. So it's a negative if you're more highly religious amongst this group that is already a baseline religious. And that impact has psychological, professional, and personal impacts. So I'll share with you in a few slides what that looks like. So let's talk just one data point. There are many to talk about, but here from patients, right? Um, I share with you my own experiences that I had as a resident. Well, um, that was many years ago before these surveys. Uh, and I mentioned 9% in 2013 of physicians from this national sample said that they had a patient refuse their care in 2021, 33% uh, because the provider was Muslim. And here's a quote, a patient saying, how do I know you're not ISIS? How do I know that being a Muslim, you're going to really treat me and you're not actually trying to harm me? Uh, I mentioned there are different other levels, right? So from, from peers and from supervisors, and this is kind of the narratives and experiences that come out. So from a coworkers, uh, an Arab physician in our, in our interview said, you know, I was scrubbing the OR. There were nurses who would give me a hard time of wearing a long sleeve shirt under my scrubs or having a hard time because I'm wearing a hijab into the OR and they would just make comments about sterility. Um, leadership wouldn't often take action when there are uh, things, for example, the other events with alcohol. So a physician said, I, I'm always marginalized because most of the events on campus contain alcohol. They don't cater for my dietary choices or options. Um, in terms of maintaining their religious practices, this is also a struggle. So here are a couple of quotes from Ramadan fasting. People would proactively ask supervisors, that's going to be Ramadan from this time, this time. Can you put me on an easier rotation? This is from a resident in a resident years. Some years it happens, some years it wouldn't. Or just the idea that I have to pray. So again, at the lower level, meaning when they're early in their career, as a resident or trainee, where you might expect they're more protected, but they would say, you know, I wasn't vocal enough than myself to say I have to go pray. Um, or Friday prayers, right? The coworkers are, are would question why they have a two hour lunch on Friday and others don't have that. So this would be a challenge for them just to maintain the daily idea of I want to fast or I want to pray while I'm working. I mentioned sort of at the institutional level, right? So the, the, in this, again, in the sample, there were uh, a lot of narratives around their identity not being accommodated, generally speaking. So this is a physician who said, you know, I worked seven Christ Christmas for seven years, but I never would get any coverage for my Eid holidays. Uh, in terms of diet, again, I mentioned alcohol. So now it's more than that, right? Patients also feel there's no halal food. So there will be, this uh, physician mentioned that they told their administrator, here are all the dietary restrictions for our practice group. And they said, well, if you can't have the lunch that we buy for you, just bring your own lunch. We're not, we can't accommodate these different sorts of preferences. It wasn't an inclusive environment. And then in dress and appearance, again, the perception that, you know, if I have a beard, it'll draw more attention to the fact I'm Muslim and that's only going to be negative. So, Right, seen in this case, not invisible, perhaps subject to some uh, increased discrimination uh, and perceptions of difficulty, at least, in maintaining their identity at the workplace. So what happens? So in our national service, again, we asked the question, did you leave a work environment because of discrimination? 7% of the national sample said in 2013, yes, we did. Or almost a third in 2021 that they left a specific job because of discrimination they experienced at that workplace. Uh, here's an example from an academic physician who was talking about, right, the, the escalator point that was making me, me discrimination feel nervous and I had to change my job. And now that we talk a lot about wellness, right, uh, maybe in 2013, not as much. So we had some items in the 2021 survey around levels of depression, anxiety, and burnout. And I'll say here, 29% say that they were feeling some degree of burnout or exhaustion right, because of the experiences. And this was tied to in our survey data, experiences of discrimination or reported experiences of discrimination. So this is also a problem for their wellness. So what are the implications of what I presented to you, right? Both from the patient perspective and the provider level, well, Muslims are seen, but are invisible, right? They're subject to the adverse outcomes due to their religious identity, but few accommodations exist for that religious identity, and there certainly is a lack of attention to their religious needs on both levels. So for clinicians, oftentimes, they might go into the profession thinking that it's a calling, and particularly a religious calling, to serve others, right? But then it becomes a mark for 
adverse outcomes and adverse experiences. For patients, disclosing that you're a Muslim when you get admitted to the hospital does not accrue any good package of services to accommodate your identity. It can only potentially lead to discrimination. So oftentimes they don't disclose, right? And that creates a cycle. Well, there are not that many Muslims coming in. Why should we create these accommodations? And that's what I've experienced when we try to make policy change at various hospitals. Um, I will say, right, but to leave you with some, some positives, that in these national reports and policy reports that I have, there are some, uh, we asked physicians and patients, right, what would you like to see and how can we accommodate you in the healthcare environment and your identity? And there are some, right? So, so the idea that we have this neutral prayer space, I mentioned that a couple of times now, both patients and physicians noted this, right? Or that there is an established Friday prayer for people who are working, they can attend that, or at least they are allowed to leave campus and go to a mosque and come back or their schedule accommodates that notion. For Ramadan fasting, we oftentimes do remark, thankfully, many holidays for many different groups. This can also be marked and prominent, but the issue here is about allowing for schedule changes, right? Can you imagine, you know, fasting 18 hours a day in the summer, we were just doing that a couple months ago, a couple years ago, and still having to be on call at night, right? This is a challenge. So sometimes you can make accommodations and yes, yeah, it's gonna be hard, not easy, but to let people feel that they can do the religious practice that they have to do. And as I mentioned, marking the Eid holidays. Dietary preferences can be taken into account, right? We are, uh, we are very sensitized to this for various populations. Oftentimes, Muslims feel that they don't have such accommodations for halal food. And in patient uh, interviews, they say, well, you know, if God has mandated this, this food, some, it must be better for me. It must be healthier, and it must be more important when I'm sick, yet I don't get it in the hospital. We mentioned the idea of hijab and having policies around how you can weigh their hijab in the OR. Uh, and actually, there aren't substantive uh, research to suggest there is higher infectious risk. But nonetheless, we can have policies around how you can wear the hijab in the OR and in the ICU and other places like that. Generally speaking, for religious accommodations, I think a hospital should have faith community liaison positions, right? Where they, they create this role that both for the patients and the providers, they assess and understand what the composition of that of the of those groups are from a religious affiliation perspective, and what sorts of accommodative needs needs they have so they can accommodate them. And then we should develop workplace equity programs that do think about the religious identity of the individuals, both within the patient population and the physician and the uh, clinician population, that we should actually make diversity inclusion be about religious diversity as well and religious inclusion as well. So uh, before I close and take the last few questions, you know, I think accommodating physician religious identity talked about Muslims in general, but it proceeds along a gradient, right? From observances, right? Like prayer, like uh, the idea that we've had, and there are some, Shabbat, uh, Shomer Shabbat residencies in, in New York, which can allow uh, Orthodox Jewish uh, residents to take uh, the Sabbath off, uh, or beliefs and values, right, around conscious clauses and supporting life, so, I mean, you know, with raw life support and brain death, to motivations and worldviews, right, should be in our educational dynamic. I think this is really important, because in our surveys, we find that the incidences of unease are really significant in training. And in training, once you have this idea that I can't be my authentic self, then you carry that in your, in your career. But we do certain things that might disrupt certain religious worldviews, right? Around general exams for paid actors or how Catholic social teachers might manifest and how you want to participate or not participate in certain reproductive health procedures. So I think we should be cautious about that and not let trainees feel that they can't be their authentic selves when we try to, and we should try to accommodate them in the way that we develop our curricula. So my call to action generally is that we should, the awareness of the what here is the awareness of the religious identity. Gather local data, because we don't have national data on the religious needs and quality of care and, uh, or perceived quality of care of the environment towards Muslim patients and providers, but it could be of any uh, religious background. Understanding of the why, explore barriers around data collection, right? About religious affiliation and around policies that accommodate religious uh, dimensions of, of the human being. Strategize as a where to go and collaborate over the how, right? So we should develop, I mentioned this idea of a faith community liaison, but equity champions, right? And drivers of change and policy action attendant to the religious dimension of the human being and gather multi-sectoral, multi-disciplinary community and stakeholder engaged action and accountability plans. If we have a dashboard that ignores the religious dimension of identity, well, what are we telling our religious populations? That they're, that thing that's prominent to them doesn't, doesn't matter. 
So, and lastly, I'll just put this model up and I think I've overstayed my time that I think that we must attend to these things with the idea of culture, humility, pluralism and tolerance of inconvenience, right? That we should discover the meanings and values attached to uh, living and dying and other things that are important in the healthcare encounter. Think about and consider our cultural norms in the United States might be different from other cultural norms and the constraints that we have might be different, but we have to consider them when we take action plans and then negotiate and accommodate what we do and what we don't do so that we can have a more equitable healthcare environment. With that, I'll close. Thank you for your time.